have heard the saying, jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah, most of you. You know, the interesting thing is when you ask people, is that a compliment or a dig, it kind of depends on their opinion, right? Some people see it as positive, some people don't. Now, the, the history behind this, the origin of this phrase, actually dates clear back to the 14th century and a poem by a man named John Gower. The full line from the poem is, a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. You know, in the original context, it, it seems like jack of all trades is a more positive connotation. A lot of ways I consider myself to be a jack of all trades. Maybe not all trades, but several different things, right? But the thing is, for much of my life, I, I wasn't sure that was really positive. I could do lots of things, but I didn't feel like I was great at anything. Growing up in a small town, sports was very big. And so for several years in middle school, I, I ran in track ran several different events, and I don't think I ever won a race. I played football for three years of high school, but even in my small town, I was never a starter. Now, Mullen, where I grew up, is huge into wrestling, and so I wrestled all four years of high school. I went to state, three of them, but I never won a state medal. When I was in college, I I really got into photojournalism for a while. And I was even lucky enough to get two different freelance jobs with magazines. But the second one of those jobs, uh, they didn't publish a single one of my photos, and they sent me this wonderful letter that said, we're gonna go in a different direction. <laughs> Looking back, I'm thankful I had all of those different experiences. But as a young man trying to find my place in the world, it, it didn't always feel great. I wished I could find my thing, this, this place where I would fit perfectly. Maybe there are people here who have felt that at times as well. In today's scripture, Paul talks about this idea of being all things to all people. And like the jack of all trades saying, it, it kind of depends on your perspective whether that's a good thing or not. See, this month we're continuing our sermon series called Don't Fit In. And the idea, the concept behind it is all that as Christians, we should look and act and be different than the world around us. But today's scripture reading, it, it almost feels out of place, right? Paul seems to to advocate for almost the opposite in today's text. He, he seems to change who he is to fit in with different groups. And so we're left wondering, is Paul suggesting that we change who we are, how we act, or, or even what we believe so that we can reach people? I mean, Paul's words and approach here seem to be the complete opposite of what we read in Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. I mean, is Paul saying it's okay to conform as, as long as our intent is to share the gospel? I know there are some people who, who kind of read it that way, but I, I don't think that's the message he's giving us. And I think... It's important that we understand his words in the overall context he was writing them. See, part of the reason that we paired this sermon series with a, a Bible reading challenge is so you have a chance to read the entire letter to the Corinthians. If we just read one piece of it, if we just pull out this piece, it, it doesn't have the same meaning. The context matters. See, Paul writes this letter to the church in Corinth because they've been fighting with one another, because they're divided on different issues. In chapter 1, verse 12, he writes, uh, each of you says, I belong to Paul or to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. See, the different groups, they, they've started to identify with their teacher, 
instead of the gospel. Then in chapter 8, he addresses something again. Here, the, the people have been divided about whether they can eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols. Some in Corinth say yes, some say no. And so they send a message to Paul and say, you've got to settle this for us. Now today, we probably can't really wrap our heads around and understand this debate on food, but we do get the concept, right? We can see division sometimes even in the body of Christ. That's why we have so many denominations in our world. And yet one of the interesting changes that is happening in our culture is this shift away from denominational loyalty. Now, 50 years ago, if you moved from one community to another, chances are you joined whatever denomination you were a part of before. If you were a Lutheran or a Baptist or a Methodist, that's the church you joined when you got to the new community. But today, people are much more likely to switch denominations. It's less about that denominational tie and more about whether the church feels welcoming. If, if the worship style fits them, if, if the worship times fit their lifestyle. When researchers ask people why they join a church, if they're a welcoming community or not is one of the biggest factors in every uh, one of these research projects. I actually remember a, a survey that we did at a church I was at several years ago, and one of the responses was from a woman who said, this is a friendly church, but I'm yet to make a friend here. Years later, that, that comment still nudges me and challenges me. This great reminder that it, it's not just about having a good worship service. It's not just about having a great welcome team. It's about how all of us are called to relationship with one another. Only today's text is not really about worship, right? It's, it's about evangelism. It's about how we talk to the world around us. And Paul starts out this section of the letter in verse 19 by saying, For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might gain all the more. I've made myself a slave, right? It's, it's a powerful statement. Of course, we've got to admit that in our culture and our world today, we don't understand what it means to be a slave in quite the same way the original audience did. But we do still kind of get the point of what he's saying, right? Professor Melanie Howard, in her commentary, talks about this awkwardness of Paul as a free, educated man in the culture to call himself a slave. Because slaves didn't have a choice. She writes, would they, these slaves, have felt hardened that Paul recognized and identified with their experience? Or would they have been affronted by the claim of a free man to understand their particular oppression? It's an interesting perspective. And on some levels, we get it and we understand. I mean, the reality is... I don't know what it's like to experience the sexism some women in our culture have faced. I can't tell you what it's like to face racism. I don't know what it's like to be homeless or to be food insecure. And yet I'm called as a Christian to sympathize with people who are struggling to try to relate to their circumstance. This week, my, my son shipped off to basic training, and a couple days in, he called, and, and he said, this is so much harder than I thought. <laughs> I, I wasn't in the military, so I can't, can't completely identify. But we try to relate where we can, right? 
We may never know what it's like to be in someone else's shoes, but we strive to meet them where they're at. We strive to understand and have compassion for what they're experiencing. But like Paul, you and I have never really experienced being slaves. And yet we understand this this challenge he calls us to, to live a life of service, to work for the good and benefit of others and not just ourselves. In another one of his letters, Philippians 2.4, Paul writes, let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others. I think this is part of the sentiment he's getting at in today's text too. But the thing is, Paul isn't advocating for us to change ourselves depending on who we're talking to. He isn't saying in order to reach a fallen world, you should act the same way. I mean, the reality is sometimes we, we just don't fit in with the world around us. Not just as Christians, but in life in general, right? When I was in high school, I, I worked three summers as a ranch hand. But the particular ranch I worked on was owned by a a pretty wealthy banker. (laughs) And he only came out to the ranch a few times a year. It was more of a a hobby for him than a lifestyle. I'll tell you, I always got a kick out of branding season because he and his family would bring all of these friends from the city out to experience being a cowboy, right? And they would show up with these $400 new boots and this big hat, and and they'd be all decked out thinking that's what it means to be a cowboy. And then they'd try to get on a horse, and it was kind of (laughs) entertaining. One of our bosses offered to every one of them, we'd like you to wrestle one of these calves to the ground, and man... Is it a joy to watch, right? They tried, but they just didn't fit in. Sometimes people misinterpret what Paul's saying in verse 22. I've become all things to all people. It doesn't mean we're supposed to to be something we're not. He's not saying we should be ingenuine or, or fake, And he's certainly not saying that we should sin just so we fit in. Princeton theology professor Eric Bredo writes, Becoming all things to all people does not require losing oneself. Instead, he, Paul, describes a radical way of life in which he walks alongside all kinds of people in order to draw them to God. Be quick to admit, though, that it's easy to misinterpret this concept. See, one of the mantras that that I really focus my ministry on is this, this idea that we are called to meet people wherever they are spiritually and walk with them. I worry that the church universal, it it often misses the boat, so to speak, when it comes to evangelism. Too often, the church looks at people and expects them to conform before they come to worship. (laughs) We have this tendency to, to intentionally or unintentionally look at people and say, well, you have to behave a certain way before you can be a part of the group. You have to follow God's rules even before you have a relationship with that God. That's really not helpful. As a matter of fact, it it too often pushes people away. But the other extreme, I'll admit, is just as damaging and dangerous. Some people hear this idea of of meeting people where they are and think it means our job must be to accept people's beliefs and values no matter what. That we accept everything with no judgment. To tell people whatever you believe, that's okay. It's this, this crazy concept that our world seems to push of of having a relative truth. And what's true for me may not be true for someone else. 
But that's not what Paul is advocating here. He, he's not saying there's some relative truth. He's saying our approach needs to be contextual. That, that how we reach and minister different people changes depending on their situation, their circumstances, and their culture. But I know even that idea can sometimes rub people wrong. I have a, a friend and a mentor who always pushes back on this idea of contextual ministry. More than once he said, Mike, if God is the same yesterday, today, and always, how do you justify a contextual message? Part of me gets it, right? I mean, we can't, we can't water down the gospel just so we get more people through the doors. And yet we have to recognize that everyone is, is at a different stage in their spiritual journey. And simply telling people that they're wrong rarely convinces them that we're right. <laughs> oh, but, but loving people through those differences, walking with people in their brokenness, being with people even when we disagree, that's what Paul calls us to do, who we are called to be in Christ. See, for me, the key to, to all of this rests in verse 22. To the weak I became weak so that I might gain the weak. I have become all things to all people that I might by all means save some. It's a crazy concept in our world today. And it's one of those places that, that we start to not fit in with the culture around us. See, our world glorifies strength, not weakness. And yet, a big part of being a Christian is, is coming to this realization and, and recognition that we are all weak in one way or another. We are broken and fallen and sinful. And it's, it's through our brokenness that people begin to see Christ's holiness. But it goes against what the culture tells us, right? Society says you're supposed to be strong or at least look strong. If you want people to listen to you, if you want people to follow you, you have to be strong and great. But Christ says, show people your weakness, and then they'll be able to see my strength. I think that's why this verse is so meaningful to me, and why it's been so powerful in shaping the way I do ministry. Pastor and professor Michael Knowles shares this in one of his books. He says, The one resource that genuinely faithful preachers of the gospel have in abundance is a parade of daily reminders as to their own inadequacy, unworthiness, and dare we admit it, lack of faithfulness. Oh, I get that. How every day I, I see those places that I don't feel like I'm good enough. I realize I can't do it on my own. And it's through admitting our own weakness that God opens doors to reach others. It's when we recognize and admit that we are broken that we reach broken people, even if they're broken in a different way than us. So here's the thing, for, for many of us, we are here today because someone did just that for us, because someone loved us through our mistakes, because someone stayed with us even when they knew we were wrong, because there were people who walked with us even in our brokenness. 
came, a, I came across a commentary this week by a man named Bill Grover. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know if he's a pastor, if he's a professor somewhere, or if he's just a contributor that, that happened to write something for this site. I went to the almighty Google and I tried to research who he was, right? But it turns out there are a whole bunch of Bill Grovers out there in the world, so I don't know which one this is. But I loved his perspective. And I wanted to share a little piece of what he wrote. He said, a multitude of means exist by which we can reach people. Some friends witnessed to me directly. My wife's mother didn't think she could. So she offered me Sunday lunch if I would go to church with her. It was her prayers and her unique approach to lunchtime evangelism that helped me become a Christian. I mean, how cool is that? How amazing that by sharing a meal, she could share the gospel. The question is, what does that mean for you and me, right? See, the reality is, I, I don't know how God is calling you to share the gospel, but I know God is calling you. I don't know who the people are that you might reach or, or what places you could evangelize. I don't know what approach fits for you, but I do know without a doubt that if we just sit in our pews and hope people come to us, we've missed the gospel. We've missed the mission of the church. I don't know what it will mean for you. I, I don't know if maybe you're supposed to invite a friend to church. Maybe it's a neighbor that, that needs that invitation. Or maybe it's a coworker that you think would never go to worship with you, but maybe they'd go to a Bible study in the break room at lunch. Maybe it's someone you know who loves to read, and, and you've got a great book that could speak to their soul. Or maybe it's just someone who would say yes to a cup of coffee and a chance to talk about this Jesus. I don't know, maybe... Maybe God's asking you to share the gospel on the golf course or in the stands at a baseball game. Maybe it's someone or someplace you never expected <laughs> because that's exactly how our God works. What I do know is that God needs you and me. For whatever reason, in his crazy plan, he calls us to share the gospel. And, it, and if you don't like one method, keep trying, because there are boundless ways to share the gospel. But whatever method, whatever place, share the gospel. Because like Paul, when we do... Oh, by God's grace, we just might help save some people. And that, that is an incredible mission to be a part of. Amen? Would you pray with me today? Loving and gracious God, we, we are so humbled and so thankful that you have called us. That in our brokenness, you still see a way to use us for your great mission. Lord, we know that there is so much brokenness out there. So many people who are hurting and struggling. So many who need your, your love and your forgiveness. Your guidance. And yet, it's so hard for them to hear the mission, the love and the gospel if we don't go share it. 
So, Lord, help us to find those places and those ways that we can best serve you. Help us to find our place and our method to share the gospel. Help us to do all things that we can so that by all means, God, we, we might help you save some. Thank you, God, for saving us and for allowing us to be part of this incredible mission. In your name we ask it. Amen.